Hey everyone, it's Ornlu, and it's time for the fifth and final part of State of the Civs 2024. So for those who have not seen the previous segments, State of the Civs is a short series I do around the start of a new year, where we take a holistic look at all of the civilizations in AoE2 right now, assessing not just how balanced they are, but also how cohesive is their design. Basically, do these civs feel like a natural part of the AoE2 roster? Are they unique? Do they have situations where they shine and situations where they struggle? Do their bonuses feel gimmicky or out of place? That sort of thing. In an attempt to quantify these fairly nebulous concepts, as well as to keep track of all the different civs in the game, we're going to put everybody on a modified tier list. I explained what I mean by the different tiers in the first part, so be sure to check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Of course, this is episode 5, and since we're going in alphabetical order, today we will be finishing up with the Saracens, Sicilians, Slavs, Spanish, Tatars, Teutons, Turks, Vietnamese, and Vikings. In addition, because it's the last segment, I'm going to give some quick closing thoughts on the current state of the civs in the metagame at the very end. Lastly, if you guys are excited for this breakdown, be sure to leave a like on the video Video, comment on what you think of the civs we cover, and subscribe to the channel for tons more AoE2 content. We're in the home stretch, guys, let's get to it. Our final day begins with a classic, the Saracens. This camel and naval civilization is an OG Age of Kings entry and has always been known for its flexibility. There's a lot going on with this civ, but it all comes back to their trademark economy bonus, the cheaper markets with the 5% exchange fee. This allows the Saracens to incorporate the market into their early game strategies much more easily and use it to sell stone and gold early on to get more more food and wood, as well as quick castle age times. In the mid game, the market can help balance your economy for military production or booming, and in the late game, Saracens just get more bang for their buck when the market prices bottom out. It's not the easiest bonus in the world to master, but with some practice, the Saracens player can more easily find themselves with the resources they need in any given moment than most civilizations. When it comes to military, Saracens are, again, all about flexibility. By my count, Saracens have a top three broadest tech tree in all of AoE2, with the only noticeable holes being cavalry. Cavalier, Halberdier, and Shipwright for water maps. Basically everything else the Civ can do. But unlike some Civs with broad tech trees, Saracens also have military bonuses for several unit types, namely camels, archers, and ships. Especially in this past year, Saracen camels are nice and tanky with their extra HP, their foot archers can deal with buildings more easily, and their faster firing galleys give them plenty of oomph on water. On top of all of that, Saracens have an incredible power unit in the Mameluke, allowing the Civ options at really any point in the game. That said, the downsides of Saracens are pretty straightforward. Forward, the market can help balance your economy, but other than the first several uses, you aren't really getting any more resources than your opponent. On top of that, most of the best Saracen units are quite expensive, and therefore rather difficult to get to in a standard game. Still, as of last year, Saracens were a dynamic civilization that was viable on plenty of different map types, and they were good enough for me to put them in the complete tier. Very much as if you need to put the effort in to make work, but one that could be used effectively in basically any game mode. However, as we keep seeing throughout this series, power creep is a very real thing, and Saracens got a substantial change in 2023 to their camels. Zealotry was removed and basically given to the Saracen camels and Mamelukes for free. That is a pretty sizable buff to the Saracen camels in the mid game, and Zealotry being replaced by Bimariston gave the Civ an even stronger death ball in the late game. So I am somewhat ambivalent about these changes, but even so, I'm going to keep Saracens in the complete tier for 2024. I worry about the arms race of Civ buffs we find ourselves in, but even so, Saracens right now feel like they're in a very good spot. They're one of those Civs that may need to be nerfed down the road if we really try and roll back some of the power creep, but for the time being, Saracens are fun, unique, and balanced, and that's everything you could possibly want in an AoE2 civilization. Well, that was a fun break from controversy. Now let's jump right back into it with the Sicilians. This infantry and cavalry civilization comes from the Lords of the West DLC, and has unfortunately been something of a problem child at all levels of play for most of its history. There is a lot to talk about here, but let's just take this one step at a time and start with their basic gameplay. Sicilians begin the Dark Age quite normally, but once Feudal Age comes in, your options already open up. The donjon is the Sicilian unique building, serving as an extra strong and expensive tower that can be built by, as well as train, their sergeant unique unit. This makes Sicilians the only civ that can create their castle unique unit in the feudal age, and opens up for some interesting plays. Reduced bonus damage also helps out the Sicilian scouts, and the super long-lasting farms give the civ a good amount of wood savings over the course of a game. Once castle age comes in, Sicilians tend to either go down the route of applying a ton of pressure with sergeants, who get a big stat buff for free upon reaching castle, Age, or the path of booming with the faster building town centers. This is the dichotomy of the Sicilians' gameplay, either a solid if not rather generic economy and cavalry approach, or the very unique sergeant pressure. In any case, faster building castles and the ability to spawn up to 25 sergeants with First Crusade give the Civ plenty of late castle age pressure. Rounding out the Imperial Age of Sicilians are decent trash, solid siege, tanky cavaliers, and donjons that can do a great job of asserting map control. Of course, Sicilians have plenty of downsides. Simply put, this Civ either goes 
for all lands that can be very frustrating to play against, or you have a very generic and bland playstyle that still gets outpaced by many other civilizations who basically do the same thing better. Sicilians just did not feel like they had much of a place on the AoE2 roster, and that is why I put them in the major changes needed tier last year. There were some cool aspects to the Civ. Donjons were interesting, the farming and TC bonuses were fine, and there was a general identity of units that prioritized resilience over raw damage. However, none of that was enough of a reason to pick Sicilians on any given map type. Nevertheless, the devs did try to address this early on in 2023 with a number of changes. In an attempt to get rid of some of the more gimmicky aspects of the Civ, the faster building castle bonus was tuned down to 50% faster instead of 100% faster, and the first crusade tech was made cheaper but spawned fewer sergeants. To compensate, sergeants themselves were made cheaper and more powerful in the early to mid game, the farming bonus was buffed, and donjons were also buffed in several ways. Sicilians needed a lot of work done in terms of rebalancing and redesigning, and at the very least, there were attempts made to improve the Civ. Unfortunately, this was nowhere near enough, and Sicilians will remain in the major changes needed tier for 2024. The only time Sicilians saw the light of day in recent months was the hyper all-in fast castle sergeant rush that was popularized by you putting in T90. In general, I don't mind strats like that existing, but it definitely should not be all that's viable with the Civ. Sicilians unfortunately feel pretty far away from a competitive, interesting, and non-gimmicky AoE2 Civ. Going now in a very different direction, our next civilization is going to be the Slavs. The final entry from the Forgotten Expansion, Slavs are classified by the tech tree as focusing on infantry and siege. Those are certainly among the unit types the Civ does best, but above all else, Slavs focus on steadily building strength throughout a game and then crushing their opponents under their heavy armies. This Civ has all of the finesse of a bulldozer. But that's not a knock against the Slavs, it's just how they play. Everything the Civ does has its roots in their main economy bonus. Farmers work 15% faster. Although one of the slower bonuses to get going, it nevertheless means Slavs will gradually get one of the best economies in the mid to late game, and all of that extra food is important for the armies that the Civ likes to field. Cavalry is an obvious choice with the Slavs, whether that be for night spam in the mid game, or their powerful heavy armored boyar in the late game. Infantry can be another direction to go with the Slav army, and the extra food from their farms, free supplies, and free gambesons make mid game infantry play more viable than it is for most Civs. Still, even if you take a more meta approach early on, the late game Slavs feature Druzhina for their infantry, providing 5 trample damage in a similar vein to Cataphracts, as well as cheap siege, strong cavalry, and good monks. Of course, as great as those heavier unit options are for the Slavs, they still take a little bit of time to get going, and the lack of strong ranged units and gunpowder can hurt when facing faster, more timing oriented Civs. Although this general dynamic felt distinct with the Slavs last year, the Civ ultimately fell a bit bland and overshadowed by the other boomy, cavalry y sorts of Civs, and I ended up placing them in the Something is Off tier. However, I have to say, Slavs have received some of the most well targeted balance changes of any Civ throughout 2023. The cost of Boyars was rebalanced to be more food heavy, and the elite tech was made cheaper. When Gambesons was introduced, Slavs ended up getting that tech for free in addition to supplies. Druzhna, one of the most fun and powerful unique techs in the game, was made cheaper. Even Slav monks, which were largely generic after losing the orthodoxy tech in 2022, were given a new bonus of faster movement speed. All of this made Slavs more interesting as a Civ, as their most powerful and interesting options became more attainable. Still, they weren't quite there in terms of raw strength, therefore with the release of the Mountain Royals, Slavs got their old farming bonus back of 15% faster working farmers, up from the 10% the Civ had for quite some time. Now in 2024, Slavs are a compelling civilization on plenty of different map types, and I will be bumping them up all the way to the complete tier. They're still a bit slow to get going, but Slavs can now execute their ideal game plan much more consistently in the current fast-paced meta. My one concern is that, like Saracens, Slavs have been overcompensated to account for power creep, so in time, they may need their farming bonus tuned back down to 10%. Still, right now, in February 2024, Slavs are in the best spot the Civ has ever been in, and that's something to be happy about. On to the other side of Europe for our next civilization, the Spanish. This gunpowder and monk civilization will be the last from the Conqueror's expansion, and one that has always occupied a unique place in the metagame. Spanish have always revolved around their broad tech tree and conquistador unique unit, which seems paradoxical if you think about it, but with Spanish it definitely makes sense. On most maps, Spanish are looking to survive the early game, because unless you're going for a big tower rush with the faster working builders, this Civ possesses very few impactful bonuses until mid game. Once Castle Age comes in, however, it's conkin' time, baby! Conquistadors are just such a powerful blend of attack, range, speed, and armor that it's just one of the best unique units to go for in early Castle Age. That said, even if they lack direct bonus, Bonuses, Spanish can still basically do any other mid-game option except for crossbowmen, the tech tree is totally there. It's just that without a major economy bonus or military bonus, the Conquistador is typically your best bet to stay alive and get some damage done. Still, in the Imperial Age, other options become available to the Spanish. Conks are still perfectly viable, although less dominating than in Castle Age, but the Civ also has
has paladins, bombard cannons, siege rams, inquisition monks, and missionaries, and is the only Civ in all of AoE 2 to have a complete trash unit tech tree. On top of all of that, supremacy villagers are tough to raid and are great at spamming bombard towers all over the map. Unfortunately, Spanish aren't all that popular anymore in most settings, and it's not difficult to see why. They're simply too slow in the current metagame. This was even true last year, and why I play Spanish in the something is off tier. You really don't see this Civ outside of Nomad, where they are still top tier. Interestingly, Spanish got a bit of a small rework in 2023. Conquistadors were nerfed, giving the Castle Age version one less Pierce Arbor, making archers and skirmishers more viable counters. In addition, Nomad starts were changed so that no Civ had a bonus until their first TC was built, removing one of the biggest strengths of the Spanish, that the starting villagers could get that TC built faster than most civs. Conversely, the civ received a new bonus. Each technology generates 20 gold when researched. This certainly fits the theme of the Spanish and helps smooth out their early game a bit. Finally, the missionary got a buff in that it now gets plus one range with the Inquisition tech. But where does that leave Spanish now in 2024? Unfortunately, Spanish are still a victim of power creep, and I will place them in the power crept tier. They are still very good on Nomad, but other than that, Spanish are simply eclipsed by faster civilizations. I actually think think that the Conquistador nerfs and subsequent buffs to other areas were good changes for the Civ, making them less one-dimensional in the mid-game. However, you just so rarely get to see these guys anymore. Perhaps this is another one of those instances where nerfs to other civilizations will give Spanish a bit more of an opportunity to shine. Once more to the step, we now turn to the Tadars. This is the last last con civilization, and it's going to be only one of two to be given the Cavalry Archer designation by the Tech Tree, the other being the Mongols. Indeed, these two civilizations share plenty of similarities, but but broadly, Mongols are about speed and raw strength, whereas Tatars are more technical, focusing on finesse and timings. Before anything else, Tatars have their eco bonus of herdables lasting 50% longer. This is actually more of a feudal age bonus than a dark age bonus, as the Tatar player is better able to delay switching into farms than most civs. In mid game, Tatars also get a couple of extra sheep with each additional town center built, which is quite nice. Still, Tatars are all about the military, boasting several useful bonuses and techs. The most broadly applicable bonus is that all units and buildings deal an additional 25% damage when fighting from higher elevation. This already makes Tatars a very tactical civilization, as placing your powerful ranged units on the high ground can go a long way in giving you the advantage in an otherwise even battle. On top of that, Tatars also get some important upgrades at the archery range for free, Thumbring, and Parthian tactics. Free Parthian tactics is nice, but Thumbring is the star of the show here. Your crossbowmen immediately get that faster fire rate upon reaching Castle Age, and your cav archers have the accuracy needed to be more effective in low numbers. As the game goes on, cav archers, step lancers, hustle, Sars, Kashyyyks, and even Siege can all be strong options with this Civ. Heck, you even have Bombard Towers for a slow push. Of course, all of this is at the cost of a more permanent eco bonus. Yes, the longer lasting sheep are nice, but with 44 other Civs in the game, it doesn't really feel all that impactful. Furthermore, Tatar infantry is pretty awful as they are the only Civ to miss the Chainmail Armor upgrade, aka plus two defense for infantry, and as well as lacking Bombard Cannons and anything close to good monks. Tatars have a lot of flexibility between the different mounted units they can make, but still, everything this Civ does well is basically on a horse or a camel. That said, as of last year, Tatars remained a dynamic and interesting civilization that filled a niche among the steppe civs of Mongols and Cumans, focusing much more on variety and timings. They were also viable on plenty of map types, and I did end up placing them in the complete tier. Even by early last year, Tatars were largely unchanged by the devs, and only received a small buff to Flaming Camels in 2022. In 2023, the civ also received only one direct change, which was a slight creation speed nerf to the Kashyyyk Unique unit. Unfortunately, as I keep on saying, power creation is very real, and in the current meta in early 2024, Tadars are rarely seen on most map types. And yes, I will be dropping them into the power crept tier. Even on a map where the Civ historically did quite well, Gold Rush, Tadars are very rarely seen these days. Like the other power crept Civs, I don't think there's anything wrong with Tadars, and with a few nerfs to some of the most popular Civs, these guys should see a lot more play. Going right back to a classic civilization, we now have the fan favorite Teutons. This infantry civilization is of course from the Age of Kings, but beyond doing infantry well, Teutons are known as a defensive juggernaut. These guys are the epitome of slow but powerful armies. In practice, Teutons only have one economy bonus, but it's a darn good one, as Teuton farms cost minus 40%. This provides tons of wood savings throughout a game, becoming useful from the moment you add farms in Feudal Age. Although there are better civs out there economically, this is not an area where this civ will likely fall far behind. But like I said, the most memorable aspect of Teutons is their heavy units and defensive options. Extra garrison space for towers and town centers, inherent conversion resistance, free herbal medicine and murder holes, extra healing range for monks, and castles that can go up to 13 rage all help the Teuton player hang on until they get to their deadly armies. Slow but strong units are the core of this civilization as their infantry, cavalry, and even siege can all 
all boast extra melee armor. On top of that, the Teutonic Knight is the slowest, strongest, and most well-armored infantry unit in the game. Naturally, the flip side of this is that the Teutons have very poor ranged options and few mobility options. Even as if, like, Slavs has fully upgraded Hussars, Teutons don't even have light cavalry or husbandry. Age of Empires is hardly the first game to have the slow but strong archetype, but it's always a memorable one, and the Teuton civilization really encapsulates that well. That said, despite the unique and memorable identity, I did bump Teutons down to the almost their tier last year. Even without specific balance changes, Teutons were already lagging behind other civilizations on closed maps where they're supposed to be at their best. Despite getting a gold reduction cost to the Teutonic Knight unique unit, the fast-paced meta has not been kind to the civilization. It's not like they're hopeless on most land maps, and they're still a good pick on closed maps, it's just other civs are better. Because of this, I don't think it's going to be any surprise to you guys that Teutons will be bumped down to the power crept tier for 2024. Bohemians and Burgundians in particular play as stronger versions of Teutons on closed maps. Ultimately, I think this says a lot about Teutons that during the peak of the monk meta, the civ that has built-in conversion resistance was barely picked at high levels. That said, Teutons are not weak, and like the other power crept civs, some nerfs to the top picks in the current meta would go a long way in making our literal caped crusaders feel more relevant. Down to our final three, we next have yet another classic civilization, the Turks. These guys are the archetypical gunpowder civilization and perhaps lean into that playstyle more than most civs. Turks are all about ranged firepower and their bonuses certainly reflect that. Still, there are several different ways to play this civ and it all starts with faster working gold miners and strong scouts. Although you lack much of a true economy bonus, extra pierce armor scouts give you a solid option in the early game, and the faster working gold miners can help in massing archers. You probably won't be getting a huge lead early on with the Turks, but those tools can help you survive into the mid game where the civs options really start to open up. Other than the obvious holes of missing elite skirmisher and pikemen, Turks do basically everything else in the mid game quite well, and you can develop whichever army composition best fits the given situation. That said, in general, Turks like to develop their military in one of two ways, either leaning into the former step nomad aspect with the light cavalry and cav archers, both of which this civ does well above average, or they develop the gunpowder aspect of their tech tree with all of those bonuses that get a very strong Turkish gunpowder out quite quickly. Still, as strong as the Turk late game is, the lack of those critical trash unit upgrades as well as onagers can limit Turks against certain army compositions and really cripple the civ when gold runs low. The one saving grace here is that the strong Turk gold units, janissaries, cav archers, and bombard cannons can all be kept alive with good unit control, providing a unique dynamic to the civ's late game. And Turks are just such a unique civilization with their deadly gold options juxtaposed against a tech tree with massive holes, but in general, the Civ works. And I did place them in the complete tier last year. Even among other gunpowder civilizations, Turks have the best mobility options, arguably the most cost-efficient gold units, but the least efficient non-Hussar trash options. Playing Turks was and is a very different experience to playing Bohemians, Portuguese, or Spanish. Still, the extreme dynamics of Turks did give them some lopsided matchups on closed maps, and the major change the Civ received in 2023 was to reduce the range of non-elite Janissaries from 8 to 7. As much as it pains me, this is actually a good change that makes the Civ just a bit better balanced on the maps where they excel without hurting them too much in the long run. They also got a cost increase to artillery, which as it's an incredibly good unique tech, felt fair. Because of this, I think Turks are still in a good spot for 2024 and will be keeping them in the complete tier. Turks are always going to shine the most on maps that go to the Imperial Age, but they still feel totally viable on plenty of different map types. It's very tricky to balance a Civ like Turks that possess so many streams, but for the time being, I think these guys are in a good spot. The penultimate civ for this entire series is going to be the Vietnamese. An archer civilization from the Rise of the Rajas DLC, Vietnamese are actually the most recent civilization to focus on that archetype. Compared to the other foot archer-centric civs like Britons, Ethiopians, and Mayans, Vietnamese are the most defensively oriented, prioritizing tanky units and efficient armies to range or power. Before you do anything else in a game, the first Vietnamese bonus you will notice is that you can see where the enemy TC starting location is. This is just a nice bonus that can help in several small ways. You can make a beeline to your opponent's base to lame them, or at least see what they're doing, or you can simply stay at home and comfortably push deer. On Nomad maps in particular, this bonus is at its strongest. Once the Feudal Age arrives, Vietnamese can really focus on their strong ranged units. The extra HP for archers and skirms means that both of those units take a couple of extra hits to be killed by basically everything, and that allows the Vietnamese player to take efficient fights. Economically, Vietnamese are at the very least quite solid, as the fast researching eco-upgrades that don't cost wood 
would help ensure that you don't fall behind your opponent's income. From mid-game onward, Vietnamese focus on these efficient armies anchored by ranged units. Against other ranged units in particular, Vietnamese excel as the Rattan Archer unique unit and Imperial Skirmisher team bonus unit both possess all the pierce armor you could ever need. Beyond that, Halberdiers, Bombard Cannons, and Elephants all give the Civ good options in grindy games, further supplemented by the Paper Money unique tech generating a steady trickle of gold from Lumberjacks. In general, Vietnamese are a well-rounded Civ that possess few major weaknesses. Missing Blast Furnace, Hand Cannons, and Redemption are all certainly noticeable holes in their tech tree, but most everything else you could want is totally there. Last year, Ornley was pretty happy with the civilization and placed them in the almost there tier. Paper Money was still in kind of a weird spot as it costed gold, and I didn't love Imperial Skirmishers existing as a team bonus unit, but still, the core identity of the Civ was totally there, and they felt like the most viable the Civ had ever been. Throughout 2023, Vietnamese received some further buffs, such as making Paper Money cost wood instead of gold, reducing the cost of Imperial Skirmisher, and most impactfully, adding the bonus where economic upgrades research 100% faster in addition to not costing wood. Now, in early 2024, I'm not too sure what to think of the Vietnamese. I'm gonna leave them in the almost there tier, and although I like the Civ, it still doesn't feel quite right. They are a powerful option in today's metagame, and might be slightly too strong and versatile. However, if that is the case, it's not by much. I still don't like Imperial Skirmishers existing as a team bonus, but that's not gonna be a design hill that I'm gonna die on. Oddly, one of the weirdest aspects of Vietnamese is that they feel like the preeminent Cav Archer Civ in the current meta. Yes, their CA getting 10 extra HP in the mid game is nice, but I'm not too sure I love Vietnamese being played primarily as a light Cav slash Cav Archer Civ. Maybe the devs could make the HP bonus only apply to Foot Archers? I don't know. Regardless, Vietnamese are, at the very least, in a solid spot. We will be closing things out with our 45th and final civilization, the Vikings. This infantry and naval civilization is also going to be from Age of Kings, and has certainly seen its ups and downs over the years. Above all else, this civilization is known for two things, their economy and their navy. Economically, Vikings possess one of the best bonuses out there with the free wheelbarrow and handcart upgrades. In the early to mid game, Vikings will have a more efficient economy than their opponents, especially when it comes to farming, and on top of that, they'll find themselves ahead by a few villagers when their opponent researches those upgrades. On the water, Vikings are most famous for being one of, if not the best galley rush civ in the history of the game, and back in AOC, Vikings indeed were played far more than anyone else on water maps. Cheaper warships, docks, and a good economy just give the civ more units to fight with than their opponent. The longboat unique unit also makes for a strong, fast, and population efficient choice. On the land, Vikings have tanky infantry, decent archers in siege, and terrible cavalry monks and gunpowder. Their berserk unique unit can tear through a ton of different armies, especially when accompanied by onagers or siege rams, but it's no secret that these guys can really struggle in the later stages of the game. And this brings us to the problems of Vikings. Last year, I placed Vikings in the something is off tier, as without their thumb ring and fast Imperial Age timing, they just completely fell off a cliff in terms of perceived competitive viability. Funnily enough, the change I suggested in last year's video came to pass. Berserker Gang was rolled into the Elite Berserk upgrade, and it was replaced by a new unique tech that gave archers and longboats plus one attack. The idea behind this was that the fast Imperial Age archer timing would still not be quite as strong, but the Civ wouldn't suffer so much in the late game. In addition, Chieftains now grants extra gold when killing villagers, monks, or trade units. Unfortunately, Vikings are still in an awkward spot, and I'm gonna have to keep them in the something is off tier. Yes, they have absolutely been power crept by other civilizations on the land, but the reason I'm gonna put them in that tier is actually the water. Vikings are still a strong pick on islands, but are unfortunately considered really bad on all hybrid maps. This is where Vikings should be at their strongest, but we live in a meta ruled by fire galleys and fire ships, and the lack of those units for Vikings prevent them from being as competitive as they probably should be. Vikings are only good on water maps where you have to fully commit to the water. However, most water maps have that more hybrid approach, and fire ships excel when neither player is investing that much into water play, most likely because you're trying to simultaneously apply pressure on the land. Short of giving Vikings fire galleys, I'm not entirely sure how to solve this problem, but it's one that certainly needs to be addressed in 2024 in my opinion. Alright, with all of our civilizations complete, I want to close this series by giving a few words on the overall state of the metagame. As I'm sure you've noticed throughout the videos, the main dividing point with civilizations that weren't complete basically came down to viability in a fast-paced metagame. Some civs either feel too oppressive or just not good enough. Due to various balance changes, as well as the accessibility of online games among top players, the overall pace of AoE2 has never been faster. This is especially true of the 9 villager starts we see in many tournaments, but slower civilizations tend to struggle to find an area to shine. One of the ways the devs try to combat this was adding in more powerful bonuses to civilizations, and although that does help, we can clearly see the trend of power creeping older civs to keep up with some of the newer civs. If I have any wish for 2024, it's that some of the most powerful bonuses in the current metagame get toned back a bit, because 
because otherwise the civilization design and balance is actually quite good. There are plenty of viable civilizations on most of the different map archetypes, especially if you get rid of the top two to three best civs on any game mode. I mean, just look at the tier list. Most of the civs are in the power crept tier or higher, which means that, at least according to me, most civs are at least fairly well designed and or balanced. So I do think it's actually unfair to say that the game's balance is terrible right now or anything like that. In my mind, the best design and balanced civs fall right beneath what we could call the number one meta picks on various maps, and that should be the level of balance to shoot for when making changes. Another thing worth mentioning is the sheer volume of changes we got in 2023. There were more balance changes last year than I believe any other year in AoE history. I don't think this is a bad thing. Balance will never be perfect, but making small tweaks here and there to help more finely tune the strength of various civilizations seems like the way to go. The main thing is we need to be careful about power creep. It is always going to exist at some level, but that is no excuse for not trying to counteract that. Lastly, and this doesn't really have as much to do with like civ design or game state or anything like that, it's just the pathing. I think for most people, that is the number one issue they have with their enjoyment of any given AoE2 map, game mode, civ matchup, anything like that. So I know it's not exactly related to sort of these core design philosophy stuff that we've been talking about, but it's still something that needs to be addressed going forward. And I know it's beating a dead horse, but yeah, it, it's something that needs to happen. And well, that's it for State of the Civs 2024. Thank you all so much for sticking with me through this series. I really enjoy making them at the start of every year. AoE2 is not in a bad spot right now, and with some improvements to pathfinding and carefully targeted balance changes, this could be the best year for the general state of AoE2. We'll have to see if we can get there. As always, be sure to let me know what you think of the Civs we've covered today, as well as your thoughts on the current state of the game in general. Lastly, I do want to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, with Anonymous and Gerard in the Great Wolf tier, and then Carolyn, Dieter, Liquid Egg, product Triru and Tanduri in the Direwolf tier. If you are interested in supporting my channel further and getting some extra perks, the link to my Patreon is always in the description. But of course, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.